Friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I am the pastor of the Spring Church just about a quarter mile up the road here just as you turn to go back toward Lawrence on this road behind me. Uh, my church is situated right there, friends, and I, I come out here this afternoon out of, a, out of a care for your soul. I come out here to preach the gospel to you, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the gospel message. I come out here to warn you about your sin, to warn you about the wrath of God that is going to come upon the wicked on the day of judgment, but that God has provided the ark of salvation that when the day of his the flood of his wrath comes those who are in Christ those who are trusting in Christ for their salvation shall be saved from their sins friends i am here to make much of sin to call out sin but to make much of the savior from sin to make much of the one who saves from both the power of sin and the effect of sin many people are on the road to destruction but it is my desire that you who are on that road would be, would be found to have been changed today by the power of God. That you find yourselves to be believers upon, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, disciples of Christ, and you find yourselves on the narrow path to life. That narrow path which leads unto eternal life, friends. Your eternal destiny is of the utmost importance, friends. And you must deal with it now. Otherwise, when you die, it will be too late. It will be way too late. That's why Jesus gave the strong exhortation in Matthew 7, verse 13. He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Friends, many people are on the path to destruction. However, the doors to heaven swing open for those who will believe the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That Christ truly died for their sins and He was truly buried and He was truly raised on the third day according to the Scriptures for their salvation. Such persons can take great heart in knowing that God is true to keep His promises and therefore if they hang their salvation upon the promises of God, it is secured for them in heaven. By the grace of God and for the glory of God, all things were down to His glory. And so ultimately, my being out here today is an act of worship, an act of ascribing glory to God as I preach the gospel of His Son. And so, my dear friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this, this afternoon is found in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, we're going to look at the first two verses of this chapter. So Paul writes here, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what benefit, or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And it is that last phrase I would like to place most of my emphasis on and most of the attention on this afternoon in these brief moments I have out here the oracles of God. How important it is that when one is a recipient of the truth of God, that one be diligent that they are believing it. Friends, there is a great responsibility that you take upon yourself when you stand out here and you listen to me preach because you are hearing the oracles of God. And friends, it is a, you have a great responsibility concerning your own soul to be obedient to the gospel. See, friends, there is a call in Scripture and it is the call of obedience that you must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You must believe it. Friends, it is not enough to hear the gospel merely. It is not enough to simply be entrusted with the oracles of God. No, one must believe them. And a great example of this is the Jewish people who for thousands of years have had in their possession the, the scriptures, at least of the Old Testament. They know the truth of God's word, however, they are not responsible with it. And they themselves, many of them, reject the salvation that Christ offers. And that carries great application to where we find ourselves today here in the biblical south or in the Bible Belt, as some have called it. Many people know of the things of God or perhaps even know the gospel message. And yet, they are irresponsible in respect to those things because they do not listen. They do not give heed to those things. They do not obey the gospel of God. They do not make their calling and election sure so as to receive eternal life through Jesus Christ truly, or truly for the glory of God.
and such people are great to be pitied. Truly they are. But if you are one such person, which I believe many of you perhaps are out here, then I trust that through the preaching of the gospel, God might, if He so wills, convict you and bring you to true salvation in His Son. For, as I said, it is not enough to merely be in possession of the oracles of God, to own a Bible, to hear the preaching of the Word of God. One must believe it. One must take the gospel and receive it unto his bosom and believe it for his salvation or for her salvation. And that is what I want to consider in this verse, in these brief moments that I do have this afternoon to do so. And I want to consider ultimately what is the gospel? What is the, the chiefest of the God's oracles? What is the greatest of truths that are put forth in Scripture? It is the truth of the gospel. For there is nothing else in Scripture aside from Jesus Christ Himself that is ascribed the title of being the power of God other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is very telling. So that is ultimately the chiefest oracle that we ought to be in most responsibility concerning. And so it is ultimately that gospel that I seek to make known this afternoon unto you. To exalt God, to exalt His grace and salvation, and hopefully that you might be saved from your sins through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Lord, both He is your Lord and mine. He is Lord over your life even if you do not believe on Him. Even if you do not even confess to, uh, to know of the gospel, or you've never even heard of Him. Christ is still Lord. He's Lord of all. He is Lord of all creation and all things are working according to His plan and His decree and His will, friends. And so we ought to submit to His authority. Now before I, I, I consider this passage and walk through it very briefly, I would like to consider the context of where Paul is coming from and where Paul is going as he writes this book of Romans. We, we just, the, just at the end of chapter 2 and really the whole of chapter 2, Paul was calling out the religious hypocrites, calling them out in their hypocrisy, calling them out for saying that they know the true God, but they do not truly have salvation in the inward man. They simply had a thin veneer of religiosity on the outside, a churchianity, and not a genuine salvation inwardly. And he called them out for that. That's why he says in verse 29 of chapter 2, he says, but he who is a Jew but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. And so he brings that to a close there in chapter 2. And then that brings us into chapter 3, as Paul continues considering some of these ideas that are from Romans 2, and then he introduces a new idea in verse 2. So let us consider that now. Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul writes, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Again, in Paul's day, he was, he was dealing with this issue that the Jewish people had these great privileges. They were the visible, outward people of God. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. The prophets were sent to them. Jesus even said He was sent unto them. So Paul asks the question, okay, if that really doesn't matter in the sense of salvation, what benefit is it? And then he answers his own question in verse 2. He says, great in every respect. There is great benefit, my friends, in growing up in the biblical south. Great benefit in growing up here in the Bible Belt because we are surrounded in a lot of ways by good truth. We are surrounded by biblical truth. But it may not be unto salvation if we do not believe it. It may not be to eternal life if we do not trust in it. So he says, great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were entrusted with the oracles of God, my friends. And many of you have heard the preaching of the gospel before in your lives or aspects of it. And my friends, that is, a, we must be responsible with that truth that we've been entrusted with by God. That God has allowed us to hear. Whether you are young or you are old, there is a responsibility that you have before God to be diligent to make your calling and election sure, to be sure that you believe these truths that you perhaps have heard in your life. The Jewish people were entrusted with great and mighty truths. Great and mighty truths out of the Old Testament texts that speak of the glory of Jesus Christ. Yet when He came, what did they do? 
They acted foolishly and irresponsibly and rejected the, sa the Savior from sin. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for their hypocrisy. And so uh, there are many who sit in churches today, who sit in pews and in Baptist churches, and they hear of the oracles of God proclaimed to them. Maybe even perhaps in a clouded sense, but nonetheless some truth is given to them. But in their foolishness and in their irrot responsibility, they do not handle the oracles of God that have been given to them with great prudence and care. Friends, we are to be wise. And so therefore it is my exhortation that as I pre preach the gospel to you this afternoon, you must be diligent, my friends, to believe the gospel to repent and to flee to Christ for eternal life. Otherwise, you'll be lost in your sins eternally. God bless you, sir. And so the God of glory, the God who has created us, the God of the Bible is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One and three and three and one. Three eternal persons, one blessed Unique, divine, distinct being, essence and nature. That in nature in no way divided. God is holy. God is a just judge. As Psalm 119, 137 says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. God is perfect in all His ways, righteous in all His deeds, perfect in His dealing with the children of men. This is true concerning God's character. Indeed, this is very true. God is gracious and compassionate and abounding in loving kindness. We know that. God is love, as 1 John 4, 8 tells us. We know that, absolutely, my friends. We see that in our lives daily, my friends, put on display for us. However, these attributes of God never neglect the rest. The attributes of God, such as love and grace and mercy, never neg negate His holiness. They never take away from His righteousness, friends. They never do. They never detract or subtract from these things. God's attributes are certainly not self-contradicting. And my friends, God in His perfect holiness, God in His righteousness has given us His law to obey. He has given us His Ten Commandments. And perhaps if you have grown up in church or you have been around religious people, then perhaps you have some familiarity with these commands. Commands that God gave such as, and these are taken from Exodus 20, commands such as you shall not bear false witness, you shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. My friends, these, these commands that God gave show us the character of God. They show us the perfect holiness of God and the righteousness that He possesses intrinsically. God bless you guys. They show us that God Himself is not a liar or a murderer or a thief. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us it is an impossibility for God to lie. The law of God is there to serve a specific purpose, friends. Friends, I plead with you, consider these realities. And the law of God also shows us something else. It shows us our character in light of the character of God. It shows us our sin in light of the righteous standard of God's holiness. Consider those very commands I just made mention of. You shall not lie. Have you ever lied before in your life, friends? I know that I have. We have brought this guilt upon our souls. You shall not steal. That is also a grievous sin in the eyes of God. A heinous act of wickedness. You shall not commit adultery or you shall not murder. You say, I've never committed these sins. However, Jesus came along in Matthew 5 and said, if you're angry with your brother in your heart, that's equated with murder. And if you look at lust, look at someone with lust in your heart, then that's adultery in the heart. Friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. He sees it's perverse and wicked. As Genesis 6 tells us, that God looked down from heaven and saw that the intent of the heart of man was only to do evil continually. My friends, man is not intrinsically good, but intrinsically evil in light of the holiness of God, in light of the righteousness of God. We ask ourselves, why was it that the Jewish people rejected the Savior when He came to earth? Because they were sinners, just as we are sinners, just as you are a sinner in the hands of an angry God. You need a Redeemer. My friends, you need salvation and it is only accomplished through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Flee to Christ today, my friends. Flee to Jesus for eternal life. 
For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other way of salvation but, repentant, but by repentance and faith in the finished work of Christ on behalf of the sinner. And so we have broken the law of God. We have trampled His commands underfoot. And so because of our law breaking, just as a, a murderer or a rapist here in Lawrence County must be punished for their law breaking, must be punished for having broken the law, so too it is with God. When we break His law, we deserve punishment for our sin. We deserve to be thrown into hell. That is the place of punishment for the wicked. The place where God sends sinners who have broken His law. Jesus described hell as a place of eternal punishment. A place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. A place of outer darkness where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Such a place is a place that I do not want you to go. I want you to enter into heaven when you die, my friends. So flee to Christ. Trust in Him alone. Trust in Christ for eternal life so that you might not be lost. And so hell is the place where God sends the sinner, where He unleashes His wrath against them and their sin, where He justly punishes them. It is not unjust for God to send sinners there, but it is totally just. And so we find ourselves condemned to hell without any hope in of ourselves. Without any hope in and of ourselves, my friends. However, there is great news, my friends. God, out of a great love for His elect people, out of a great love for His people whom He knew, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. God bless you, ma'am. He sent His Son, Christ, into the world to save sinners from their sin. Listen to what Paul wrote in Titus 3. He says in verse 3, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lives in spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out richly upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. My friends, the gospel is a glorious revelation of the grace of God and the holiness of God. As Galatians 4.4 4 tells us, when the fullness of the times came, in other words, at the right time, Jesus came. Almighty God came down and dwelt among men. And He came and fulfilled the law of God on behalf of the people of God. He fulfilled every command that we have trampled underfoot and broken. He truly has. He said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Oh, my friends, it is a glorious reality to know that Christ came to fulfill the law that we so horribly have trampled underfoot. Friends, flee to Christ so that you would have hope. As Nahum 1, 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. Oh, my friends, I plead with you to flee to Jesus Christ, to save you from your pornography addiction, to save you from your drunkenness and your idolatry, to save you from your selfishness, to save you from hell, which is where those sins will take you. For He will do it to the uttermost. If you cast yourself upon His mercy, He will save you. He will save you by His grace and for His glory. But as I was saying, He came down and fulfilled the law of God. That's why the Father could declare from heaven audibly. In Matthew 3.17, it reads that the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is glorious. Precious, my friends. And then He laid Himself down and was, He was willingly killed. 
He laid himself down. He was beat and whipped and spat upon and made a public disgrace and mockery. Humiliated. And he died upon the cross for the sins of the people of God as he hung there on the tree, on the cross of Calvary. The Father unleashed upon him the full fury of his wrath against sin. The Father crushed him whom he loved on behalf of sinners. That is the love of God, my friends, and both the holiness of God. It shows us that God does not sweep sin under the rug, but there must be just punishment. There must be a, a just payment for sin. Just as a, a guilty murderer cannot be simply let off the hook, someone must pay their bail for them. So too it is with God. And so too it is with the Lord Jesus Christ and His work. He purchased salvation at the cross. That's why Isaiah 53, 4 could say, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed. And then a few verses later in verse 10 it says, The Lord was pleased to crush him. In other words, it satisfied the wrath of the Father to crush his Son. We talk about the death of Jesus Christ. We talk about what Jesus did at the cross. Oh my friends, he did it unto God. He did it unto the Father. His death upon the cross was a satisfaction of divine wrath. The Father unleashed upon His Son the wrath of God that we deserve to be poured out on us in hell so that God's people could be saved. And after three days in the tomb, what happened? What happened, my friends? You know it. If you've grown up in church, you've known this, or even if you just heard this from somebody. He rose from the grave. By His own intrinsic power, the Father rose Him up as the public display that He had received His sacrifice as a sufficient payment for our sins. Jesus died to save sinners and His resurrection shows us that the Father was pleased in His death to pay for our sin. After 40 days of further ministry, He was then exalted in glory. He bodily ascended into heaven and He is seated now at the right hand of majesty on high, my friends. And those who believe on Him will be saved. The sinner's reaction ought to be to the Lordship of Christ. The sinner's reaction ought to be one of repentance and faith. The sinner must repent. They must turn from their sins. Turn from their pride. Turn from their self-righteousness. Turn from their self-trust. God bless you, sir. And believe upon Christ alone. Believe the promises of God as they are revealed in His Son. And my friends, the promise of the Gospel, as Jesus said in Luke 24, they will have forgiveness of sin. All their sins, my friends, all your sins if you repent and believe on Christ will be forgiven past, present, future out of the grace of God because Jesus died for them if you believe Him. Friends, the gospel is the gospel of the glory of God. Oh, God bless you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'm Renita. I graduated from high school with your parents. Nice to meet you. Renita, you said? God bless you. Lucas Mann, then you probably know my name. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. It's a hot day. I know. Mm. Mm. Praise the Lord. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Mm. And so, my friends, not only is the sinner forgiven if they repent and believe on Christ, but the Father, this is what's so glorious about the Gospel, the Father will count the sinner as if they lived Jesus' life. He will account over to them the righteousness of Christ. The sinner who believes on Christ will be wrapped in His perfect, eternal, justifying, sufficient righteousness. Jesus takes my sin and I get His righteousness. Jesus takes my filth and I receive His perfect righteousness as a gift of grace. That is the glory of God. That is the glorious gospel message, my friends. It is all of grace. It is all of the free grace of God. There is not an ounce of good deeds that any man can do to bring his soul to heaven. That's why Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. My friends, it is received by faith alone. It is only by faith can we please God. Only by faith, my friends. 
and it is all to the glory of God. And I want to address this very briefly because there are some of you out here who are religious yet lost. Many people, as Jesus said in, on, in Matthew 7, many will say to Him on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord. And He will say to them, Depart from Me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Why would He say such a thing? Because they were never changed. They were never genuinely changed. See, the person who is truly saved by the grace of God will bear fruit of that. Their life, their thoughts, their words. The intent of their heart, their affections, everything about them will be changed by the grace of God for the glory of God. Someone who says they have Christ, but they have not been changed. Someone who says they know Christ, but they have not genuinely borne fruit of salvation. They're lost. It's not that we are saved by our works, but our works evidence the fact that we have been saved. Our works bear fruit. They bear a testimony to the fact that God has done a work in our hearts. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, in verse 20, He said, So then you will know them by their fruits. If you want to know whether you've been genuinely saved, it's not whether you've had a religious experience or you've grown up in church. The question as to whether you have been genuinely saved is, do I bear fruit of conversion? Have I been changed by the power of God in my life? That is the question, friends. That is the question you must ask yourself. Do I bear good fruit? Other, and if that's the case, then the tree is good. But if you bear bad fruit, it's because the tree is bad. You're lost. You're lost in your sins. You need to be saved. And friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not even merely for the lost. It's even for Christians. If there are any Christians out here today, I exhort you, brethren, rest in the gospel. Rest in the truth of Scripture. Rest in the gospel of grace today and preach the gospel to your unconverted family and friends for the glory of God. Because you care, if you care for their souls, you'll preach Christ to them. It's all by grace. All by grace. Free grace. Not, not this, this weird idea of merited grace. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Free grace. All by God. So that God gets all the glory. So that God gets all the praise and salvation. My friends, God is jealous for the glory and salvation. He is jealous to receive the glory and salvation and the salvation of His elect people. Therefore I say, to Him be the glory. God has so ordered all this to bring about the glorification of His name, to bring praise to Himself. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each are working together to bring about the glory that they so deserve. The triune God is working to bring His name glory. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 11.33, he said, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Truly to God be the glory indeed. Oh, my exhortation to you who are lost, please, I encourage you to examine your life. Is any sin that you are living in at present worth losing your soul over? Surely no. And so I plead, I exhort, I plead with you concerning your soul. Trust in Jesus Christ alone. Repent of your sins so that God would save you. And you who are religious, I encourage you to examine yourselves to see whether you have truly been saved. And if you look at your life and you see that, no, I have not been, then truly I cry out to you to repent unto salvation. And if you see that you bear fruit of eternal life, if you see, yes, I am converted, I am saved, Praise God. I encourage you, my fellow Christians,
to walk and live in a manner that is worthy of the calling with which you have been called, to live for the glory of God and the glory of Jesus Christ, His Son, and to preach the gospel to your unconverted family members and friends for the glory of God. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, that Paul asked, what is the advantage of, of being a Jew? And, and we talked about the uh, implications of this for religious people today. What is the advantage of that? Well, he says in verse 2, Great is every, in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And many religious people have great advantage. They have great privilege because they hear biblical truth. But, my friends, I exhort you, especially now that you've heard the gospel presented to you, be diligent, be responsible, be prudent, be wise, my friends. To make your calling and election sure. To believe upon Christ truly for your eternal salvation. We've seen here that man is sinful, yes. We have sinned, we deserve hell, but Christ came and died for sinners and was raised on the third day on their behalf. And all who flee to Him for eternal life will be saved. Will be saved eternally. Will be cleansed by His precious blood. And we saw that it is by grace so that God gets all the glory. Indeed. To the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to the true God, to Him be glory, as He works all things according to the counsel of His most holy will, to the only blessed Sovereign, be glory, praise, majesty, and dominion, both now, tomorrow, next week, and forever. Through Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.